Chapter 3 Salty Trip with Pepper First thing back in Milwaukee, I reported to my parole officer, a Mr. Rand, I think. After asking a thousand questions and filling out a mountain of papers, he gave me an IQ test. When he computed my score, his sea blue eyes saucered in surprise. He couldn't understand how a boy with a score of 175 could do a stupid thing like peddling a girl's ass on the sidewalk. If that IQ test had been on the basis of the half-baked criminal, pimping theories that I had picked up in the joint at the table from those chili pimps that were churning in my mind, and that I was so eager to try, my score would have been zero. I was 18 now, six feet two inches tall, slender, sweet, and stupid. My maroon eyes were deeply set, dreamy, my shoulders were broad, and my waist as narrow as a girl's. I was going to be a heartbreaker, all right. All I needed was the threads and a whore. Mama's small, lucrative beauty shop was on the main drag. Poor Mama. She was doomed, I guess, to inadvertently set up my disasters. I had started on my job delivering for the drugstore owned by the friend of Mama's who had hired me to satisfy the parole condition of a job upon release. As fate would have it, Mama's shop and the drugstore were in the same building. Mama and I lived in an apartment over the storefronts. Mama called me in from the sidewalk one day about three months after I had gotten parole. She wanted me to meet one of her customers who was getting her eyebrows arched. I walked through the pungent odors rising from the hot pressing combs pulling through the kinky hair of several customers to the rear of the shop. There she was, lashy as a Christmas tree sitting before a mirror at a dressing table with her back to me. Mama stopped plucking at her brows as she introduced us. Mrs. Ibbets, this is my son, Bobby. Like a yellow cat hypnotizing a bird, she sat there motionless, her green eyes smoky, as she stared at me through the mirror. Oh, Bobby, I have heard so much about you. It's so exciting to meet you. But please, call me Pepper. Everyone does. I don't know what excited me more as I stood there, her raw sensuality or the blazing rocks on her tapered fingers that I was sure hadn't come from Crestgees. I mumbled something like I had to go back to the drugstore to work and I would see her around. Later I saw her slide into her sleek caddy convertible, her white silk dress riding up exposing the satin sheen of her banana yellow thighs. As she gunned away from the curb, she turned deliberately and gave me a full dose of those hot green eyes. She was signing our deal. I quizzed around and got the background on her. She was 25, an ex-whore who had worked the jazziest houses on the eastern seaboard. A wealthy white fence and gambler had tricked with her out there, and it had gotten so good to him that he crossed her pimp into a five-year bit and squared her up. Three days later, a half hour before closing, an order came in for a case of mums. The address was in the plush heights, miles from the store. I made the trip on a bicycle. She answered the door wearing only a pair of white lace step-ins. My erection was hard and instant. It was a fabulous pad, and the lights were soft and blue. The old man wouldn't be back for a week. I was just a het punk. I wasn't in her league, but one of my greatest assets has always been my open mind. That freak bitch cajoled and persuaded me to do everything in the sexual book, and a number of things not even listed. What a thrill for a dog like her to turn out a tender fool like me. She was a hell of a teacher, all right, and what a performer. If Pepper had lived in the old biblical city of Sodom, the citizens would have stoned her to death. She nibbled and sucked hundreds of tingling bruises on every square inch of my body. Fair exchange, as the old saw goes, is never robbery. It took me a week to get the stench of her piss out of my hair. She sure had been pimped hard back east. She hated men, and she was taking her revenge on me. She had taught me to snort girl, 
and almost always when I came to her pad, there would be thin sparkling rows of crystal cocaine on the glass top of the cocktail table. We would snort it through alabaster horns, and then in the mirrored bedroom we made circus love until our nerve ends shrieked. Pepper and that pure cocaine would have made a freak out of a priest. She had sure put me on a fast track. I couldn't know at the time that at the end of the line stood the Grimm State Penitentiary. I was green all right and twice as soft and Pepper knew it. Here was a hardened ex-whore who knew all the crosses, all the answers, who handled lots of scratch and wasn't laying a red penny on me. The dazzling edge on our orgies was dulling for me. But I was flipping Pepper with the techniques she taught me. I knew all the buttons to push for her, and she burned hotter than ever for her little puppy. No wonder I was freaking for free. Those eastern pimps had charged her a fortune. I tried one night to get a C note from her for a suit. I knew I had really come on fine in the bed. She had almost climbed the walls in passion. Sugar, I said. I saw a wild vine for a bill downtown. If you laid the scratch on me, I could cop tomorrow. She slitted her green eyes and laughed in my face and said, Now listen, little puppy. I don't give men money. I take it from them. And besides, as sweet as you are to this pussy... You don't need a suit. I like you as you are, with no clothes on at all. I was a rank greenhorn for sure, but her cold turn down of my plea for a C note was bitchy cute. And I was a salty sucker, so I reacted like any stupid would be pimp who had been Georgia. I had filed up basic business. I had led with my dick instead of my mitt. I reached down and slapped her hard against the side of her face. It sounded like a pistol shot. On impact, a thrill shot through me. I should have slugged her with a baseball bat. The bitch uncoiled from that bed like a striking yellow cobra, hooked her arms around my waist, and sank her razor-sharp teeth into my navel. The shock paralyzed me. I fell on my back across the bed, moaning in pain. I could feel blood rolling from the wound down toward my crotch, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. Pepper was sure a strange, twisted broad. She was breathing hard now, but not in rage. The violence, the blood, had turned her on. She was gently caressing me as she licked, with a feathery tongue, the oozing wound on my belly. She had never been so tenderly efficient, and she took me on a beautiful trip around the universe. The funny thing was, that throbbing awful pain somehow became a part of, melted into the joy of the feathery tongue, the thrill of the thing that Pepper was doing to me. I guess Freud was right. If it thrills you to give pain, you can get your jollies taking it. When I left Pepper, I was sapped. I felt like an old man. My mood was as bleak and cheerless as the gray dawn I cycled through. When I got home and looked into the mirror, a death's head stared back at me. The vampire bitch was sucking my life's blood all right. I also knew that crystal cocaine wasn't exactly a health tonic. Pepper was too fast, too slick for me. I had to make her shit or get off the pot. I made the skeleton in the mirror a solemn vow that before the week was out, I would in some way get Weeping Shorty, a pimp about 55 who, while a gorilla pimp, was the best pimp in town, to pull my coat, to give me a plan for putting a ring in Pepper's nose. Before I got busted, I had seen him at Jimmy's joint. He had looked horrible then, and now less than a year and a half later, he looked like a breathing corpse. Hoss was his boss. He had chippied around and gotten hooked. It was Friday, almost midnight, when I found him. He looked at me and made that clacking sound against the roof of his mouth with his tongue. You know, that mischievous, weirdly joyful sound that a young kid makes the instant before he rams a hat pin into your eardrum. Then he said, 
will kiss my dead mammy's ass if it ain't Mac and Youngblood, the whore's pet and the pimp's fret. The junkie bastard was jeffing on me, lashing me with contempt and scorn. Old pimps always know when a youngster with a yen for the pimp game is desperate for advice. After all, they remember when they started and what a bitch it was just to learn the million questions. The answers would come slowly, from heartbreaking trial and error, from the ass-kissing of the few who had solved the riddle, who pimped by the book. The cleverest pimp could give a thousand years and never come close to the answers. Weeping Shorty was an old man, and he had gotten past the questions and had worked out a few answers, but even so, he knew a thousand times more than I did. So, I fought for control. I couldn't show anger. If I did, he would cut me loose. We had been standing under the awning of a vacant storefront. He pulled me with the jerk of his head. I followed him to a big shabby Buick. It was parked at an intersection in a cheap trick district. When we got inside the Buick, I understood why he had parked it there. He could watch and keep tabs on his stable of scrawny junkie whores working the four corners of the intersection. He sat under the wheel, not saying anything, his eyes straight ahead. I had kissed his ass for a half hour, and now he was freezing up. I thought of the tiny pile of cocaine wrapped in tin foil under my instep that I had filched from Pepper. I fished it out and held it in my hand. Perhaps the cocaine would open him up. I turned to him and said, Weeping, do you want a light snort of girl? He stiffened like a butcher knife had been run into his back. He looked at the wad of tinfoil in my palm and snatched it in the same motion, hurled it through the window on his side. His top was blown. He shouted, Nigga, ain't you got no sense? You trying to go back to the joint and blow my wheels? I said, what did I do wrong? All I did was to offer you the C just to be sociable. What's wrong with that? He said, Sucker, first booty butt, you don't transport no hard in your stomp. Keep it in your mitt so you can down it fast to the turf. Second, you're on parole. You're hot. You ain't got no business sitting dirty in my short. There's a law, sucker, that can confiscate a short with stuff in it. You know if the heat had hit on you, you would unload in my short. Keep stuff off you. When you stop somewhere, down it in the street until you're ready to split. It's better to get beat for the stash than beat for the heat. Now what took your head out of Pepper's ass long enough for you to look me up? Oh, how this junkie creep bugged me. I sat there beside him trying to think of questions that would bleed him so I can get out of his face fast. He looked exactly like a withered baboon. His breath stunk like he had just eaten a bowl of maggots. I said, weeping. Pepper hasn't got my nose open for her. She's too jazzy and slick for me. I came to you because everybody knows that your game is mellow. I want you to pull my coat so I can pimp some scratch out of her. The baboon liked that banana I threw him. He was ready to talk the pimp game. He said, The suckers in hell want ice water, but it's late for them. They ain't never going to get no ice water. The way you start with a bitch is the way you end with a bitch. You can start pimping hard on a bitch and then sucker her out and blow her. But ain't no way you can turn it around and pimp on Pepper after starting with her like a sucker. Forget her and get down on a fresh bitch. I said, you mean there is no way to get any scratch out of her? He said, nah, you see, I didn't say that. I said you couldn't pimp any scratch out of her. A foxy, cold-blooded stud can always find an angle to cross a broad out of scratch. I said, I'm not foxy, 
but I think I could be cold-blooded enough to cross that slick bitch Pepper. Weeping, you are the fox. Lay some game on me and put me to the test. I'll split any scratch I take right down the middle with you. I hadn't noticed it was raining. Now it was raining hard enough so that Weeping had turned to run up the window on his side. He had just raised it and was about to answer my proposition when there was a frantic rapping on his window. It was one of his whores. Through the closed window of the locked door, she said loudly, Daddy, open the door! My feet are soaked! Nothing is happening out here tonight, and besides, I am hot as hell! The vice is watching me! It's Costello. He told me to get off the street or he would bust me. Please open the door. Weeping was a cold gorilla, all right. He sat there for a long moment. His monkey face was tight and hard. He casually opened the wind wing as the rain beat down on his hull. She stuck her nose through it. Without moving toward the wing, sitting erect in the car seat, he hollered, You bullshit bitch! Make something happen! You a whore! You supposed to be hot! Let Costello bust you! He can't make a beef stand up unless he catches you with the trick! You dumb chicken-hearted bitch! What do you think I got this ass pocket full of fall scratch for? Now, get out there and work! Don't worry about the rain! Walk between the raindrops, bitch! He slammed the wings shut. Her face was wild and angry through the murky glass. Her dope rotted teeth were ragged fangs and the dimness as she pressed her face close to the glass. She screamed, You just lost a girl. You had four. Now you got three. I'm cutting you loose, shorty. Weeping let his window down, stuck his head out into the rain as she walked away. He was all gorilla now. He screamed, Bitch! I give you odds you won't split. As much of my dope you've been shooting, I'm playing catch up. You rank bitch. You know if you split, I'll find you and stick my knife in your sticking ass and gut you to your breastbone. I wondered if he had lost her. He read my mind. He said, She ain't going nowhere. Look at this. He turned his car engine on and started the windshield wiper so we could see the street. There she was, back out there in the rain, whistling and waving at the passing cars. He turned the engine off. He said, That bitch knows I ain't jiving. She'll make me some scratch this morning. Now, young blood, about Pepper. You don't know anything about her. You ain't long out of the joint. I like you. So my advice is the same I gave you at first. Forget her. Try in another spot. When he said about my not knowing her made me curious, I said, Look, Weeping, I know you like me, and if you do, run Pepper down for me. Did you know that peck of wood of Peppers is the bankroll behind the biggest policy wheel in town? I said, No, but if the old man is flush, isn't that good? Why give Peppa up because she's in shape? If you gave me an angle, I can get some of that policy scratch. Look, blood, brace yourself. Here's the rest of the rundown. Peppa is a rotten freak broad. You ain't the only stud she freaks off with. I could name a half dozen who ride her. The dangerous one is the Lansky, the detective. He is in a bad way over Peppa. If he ever found out you were freaking off with her, blood shame on your ass. I was shaken by the rundown. Like a sucker, I believed I was the whole show in her love life. I was thinking like the young punk I was. I said, Are you sure there are that many studs laying her? He said, Maybe more. I had a belly ache and a worse headache. I felt lousy. I mumbled, Thanks for the advice and the rundown, Weeping. I got out of the Buick and walked home in the rain. When I got there, it was 3.30, and Mama was angry, worried, and raving. She was right, of course. I was violating my parole to be out after 11 p.m. 
I was coming out of the drugstore to make a delivery when I bumped into him on the sidewalk. It was old party time. While doing his year for our caper, he had copped the Lonely Hearts broad through the mails. She went his train fare. He finished the bit and went to visit her and made a home. She had died and the home went to relatives who threw him out. After five bits, he was still full of crooked aspiration. I liked him, but not enough to join him again in a hustle. I had only been out four and a half months. I cooled it and avoided him in a smooth way. I hadn't touched Pepper in a week. She had called the drugstore twice just before closing. She had made licking and sucking sounds to get me out to her place. I made excuses and put her off. I wondered at the time why I was so important when she was a douchebag for that mob that was laying it into her. The day before weeping brought me a proposition, Delansky, the roller, came into the drugstore for cigarettes and gave me a thoughtful look. I was walking home. It was my day off. It was Saturday night around nine. I had been to see a prison movie. It was a grim drama. A young green punk tried to double cross. He was crisscrossed into the joint. He made deadly enemies while doing his long bit. When he got out, a long black short pulled up and riddled him with a Tommy gun. A big black car was pulling to the curb toward me. There was something familiar about the small pinhead driver. It was weeping. He jerked his head and opened the car door. I went over and got in. He was excited. At first I thought because his car was clean. He told me, Blood, put a smile on your face. Old shorty's got good news for you. How would you like a half a G in your slide? I said, All right, give me the poison and take me to the baby. He said, I ain't shucking. It's cream puff work. In fact, tender dick is what you like to do best. Want the rundown? If you're going to tell me some broad is going to lay out 500 frog skins to get her rocks off, say it. I would lay a syphilis patient that died a week ago for that kind of scratch. Then he said, Pepper is the broad. All you have to do is take her to bed and go through a full circus with her. That's all. Are you game? Yes, if I can get a rake off from the bleacher seats, I said. And you tell me who wants the show on. His eyebrows jitterbugged. He was a slick joker. I should have run from him. He said, No, I can't tell you who. Don't worry about the scratch. It's guaranteed. Are you in? I said, Yes, but I want to know more. Like why? The tale he told me went like this. A fast hustler from New York who specializes in pressure rackets saw a chance to trim Pepper's old man out of a bundle. The hustler knew that Pepper was a dog and a freak. He also knew that Pepper's old man was hung up on her. Even though he had met her in a whorehouse and squared her up, he was dangerously jealous of her and unpredictable if he caught her wrong. The hustler felt that Pepper would be in a sweet state for pressure if solid evidence could be gotten showing Pepper as the dog she was. The hustler was sure that he could force her to help him in his scheme to trim the old man. He needed clear, unfaked photographs. His plan would be simple. Once he got the club over Pepper's head, he would force her to sneak in phony hit slips against the policy wheel. The hustler had discovered that for Pepper, from her inside position in the wheel, it would be very simple. The hustler would pay me five bills after I had brought Pepper to a prearranged setup. I was all for the scratch and eager to give Pepper some grief for the way she had used me and outslicked me. Weeping told me the trap was set. I was to wait until Pepper itched enough to call me. I was not to call her. Whenever she called, I was to tell her to meet me in the bathroom of an old but still elegant hotel on the fringe of the arcade and shooting gallery section of town. I was then to call him. I was to make sure that at least two hours passed between her call and when I went to the desk and asked for the key to apartment 214. My name would be Barksdale. 
That name I'll never forget if I live to get a hundred. On the third day after I had gotten the rundown on the trap, Pepper called the store. It was 8.55 p.m., five minutes before closing. I answered the phone. She was burning blisters for one of our parties. She invited me to her place as usual. I told her that I had to tidy up the store and also mail an important package at the downtown post office for my boss. I asked if she could get dressed and meet me by 10.30 in the ballroom of the hotel. It would be more convenient that way. She agreed. I called weeping. He told me to maneuver Pepper's face towards the head of the bed as much as possible when we got into the act. I went to the ballroom and drank a rum and coke until she got there. I almost felt sorry for her when I saw her coming through the door. She looked so innocent and clean. Not at all like the cruddy filly that humped up a funky lather beneath a mob of jockeys. We took a booth so that I could watch the clock. She was Jacqueline the Ripper with a fly. But she had a great gentle touch inside, if you know what I mean. She was a space buff, all right. She was checking out my readiness for entry into her inner space. At 11 sharp, Mr. and Mr. Boxdale picked up the key to their pad. We walked onto the stage. Wyatt Earp would have gone ape over the pad. It was overstuffed, horsehair living room, gleaming brass bed, giant cherubs on the wall, Gideon Bible on the marble, top bedroom table, midget efficiency kitchen cubicle, so what? We hadn't come to cook. High on the wall over the bed were the two gold-colored cherubs. Their eyes were holes. Their mouths popped wide holding the light fixtures. When we got into the brass bed, we got the show on the road. I was almost sure some steamed-up joke in the adjoining room had his gizmo focused on the carnival through a drilled hole peeking from a cherub's empty eye socket. Pepper let me out of her hog at 1.30 in the a.m., just two blocks from Weeping's horse stand. I felt good. I was going to collect five fat ones for my pleasant night's work. It was like having a license to steal. I spotted Weeping's pinhead in his Buick. As I walked toward him, I couldn't stop thinking about the eastern blackmailer. I thought about that green rain that would fall when Pepper started rolling those phony hits in. I thought about how I could catch a few palms full. Smooth as silk, the payoff came off. When Weeping handed me my scratch, he gave me a funny look. He said, Take it easy, blood. Take it easy. The next day I went downtown and got clean. It was the early years for the Nat King Cole trio. They were playing for a two-buck dance that night at Liberty Hall. Party and I were in the balcony at a table overlooking the crowded dance floor. We were slaving like sand hogs trying to tunnel into the flashy high yellows on our laps. They were almost stoned, ready for the killing floor. Party saw him first coming in the front door of the auditorium. He knifed me in the side with his elbow. Then Khan style from the side of his mouth he whispered, Delansky the heat. The bastard's head was on a swivel. He was looking everywhere at once. I felt mad butterflies with stingers ricocheting in my belly when his eyes spotted me and locked on me. I froze. His Jay eyes Longer were presents. still riveted to me as Pimp he walked history. up the stairway straight for me. I pretended to ignore him. He walked up behind me and stood there for a long moment. Then he dropped a hand like an anvil on my shoulder. He said, Get up. I want to talk to you. My legs were shuddery as I stood in a small alcove with him. He said, Where were you around ten and after last night? Relief and courage flooded me. That was easy. I hedged. Why? He said, Look, punk, don't get cute. Where were you? Don't answer. I know where you were. You were out on Crystal Road in the nighttime burglarizing the home of Mr. and Mrs. Frank Ibbets. Nighttime burglary is five to ten. My courage and relief swiftly drained out. Frank Ibbets was Pepper's old man. 
He was roughly frisking me now. He ran his hands into my side pockets. With one hand, he brought out the $300 left for my payoffs, plus 20 clean dollars. The other came out with a strange brass door key. He said, Geez, for a flunky in a drugstore, you got a hell of a bankroll. Where did you get it? And where and what does this key fit? I said, Officer, that's crap game money. I have never seen that key before. He grabbed me firmly like he had captured Sutton and walked me through the dancers out the door to his short. He took me down and booked me on suspicion of grand theft burglary. He also booked the scratch and key as evidence. Mama came down bright and early the next morning. She was in a near fainting dither. She was clutching her chest over her heart. She said, Bobby, you are going to kill your mama. You haven't been out six months and now you're back in trouble? What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? You need prayer. Get down on your knees and pray to the good Lord. I said, I don't need to pray. Mama, believe me, there is nothing to worry about. I didn't steal anything from Peppa's house. I am not nuts. Peppa will tell the truth. Mama, I was with her. I got my first nightmare inkling of the corkscrew crisscross when Mama broke into tears. She rolled her eyes to heaven. She blubbered. Bobby, there's no hope for you. You are going to spend your young life in prisons. Don't you know, son, your mama loves you? You don't have to lie to me. I went out to see her early this morning, she said. She told me she hasn't seen you in a week. Mr. Delansky has brought Pepper's spare key down here. That key in your pocket? was one you stole when you made a delivery out there. Finally, she went down the corridor. Her shoulders were jerking and her sobbing. It was an iron cross. My public defender went to that hotel to get corroboration for my alibi. The joint had been too crowded, too hectic. None of the employees remembered Pepper and me. At least, they say they didn't. The desk man on that night had been a substitute and wasn't now available. My signature wasn't on the register anyway. I went into court again with the dirty end of the stick. I was a parolee arrested at 1 a.m. with a bottle of whiskey in front of me in a public place. Peppa looked like a prospect for a convent. She had stripped herself of paint and gigaws. She testified that the key found in my slide was hers and that yes, it was possible that I had stolen it while making deliveries to her home. No, she had not seen me for a week before my arrest. My defender had gotten a change of venue. I was afraid to go before the judge who had sent me to the reformatory. I got two years in state prison for grand theft, the amount of $500. My parole was to run concurrently with the new sentence. Pepper's old man was with her in court. They brought the cross. I couldn't figure out who sold it to them. Was Delansky the joker that Weeping worked for? Or had Delansky heard that I had a wad and without knowing anything about the hotel affair, sold it to Pepper? For what reason had the old man bought it? Had those hotel employees been bribed or threatened? If Delansky was the brain, did he want me out of the way for a reason other than Pepper? Maybe someday I'll find out what really happened. I know if I had lots of scratch, Miss Justice would have smiled on me. She favors the bird with the scratch. The Wapun State Prison was tough, but in a different way than the reformatory. Here the cons were older, many of them murderers, serving life sentences. These cons would never put up with the kind of petty tyranny that was practiced in the reformatory. Here the food was much better. There were industries here. A con could learn a trade if he wanted to. He could go into the yard during recreation hours and learn other trades and skills. Here the desperate heist men congregated to plot new, more sensational robberies. The fruits and punks lay on the grass and the sun romancing each other. This was a prison of cliques, of bloody vendettas, 
I found my level with the soft-smoking smooth Midwestern pimps and stuff players. Since I was one of the youngest cons in the joint, I bunked in a dormitory. It was like a suite in the Waldorf compared to the bug-infested tight cells in the reformatory with their odious crap buckets. It was there, in the dormitory, that I got the insatiable desire to pimp. I was a member of a clique that talked about nothing except whores and pimping. I began to feel a new slickness and hardness. I worked in the laundry. I kept my clothing fresh and neat. It was in the laundry that I met the first man from whom I got cunning to balance my hardness. He was an old drag man with his bit getting short. He was the first to attempt to teach me to control my emotions. He would say, Always remember, whether you be sucker or hustler in the world out there, you've got that vital edge if you can ironclad your feelings. I picture the human mind as a movie screen. If you're a dopey sucker, you'll just sit and watch all kinds of mind-wrecking, damn fool movies on that screen. He said, Son, there's no reason except a stupid one for anybody to project on that screen anything that will worry him or dull that vital edge. After all, we are the absolute bosses of that whole theater and show in our minds. We even write the script. So always write positive, dynamic scripts and show only the best movies for you on the screen, whether you are pimp or priest. His rundown of his screen theory saved my sanity many years later. He was a twisted, wise man, and one day, when he wasn't looking, a movie flashed on the screen. The title was Death for an Old Con. He died in his sleep behind the high gray walls. His fate was that which lives like a specter with all cons. The fear of dying in a cell. I sure miss that convict philosopher. The wisdom he taught me took me successfully through my bit. I was released after 21 months. I got three months good time for good conduct. With good time, I was free, slick, and bitter. No more small towns for me. I was going to the city to get my degree in pimping. The pepper cross had answered a perplexing question for me. Why did justice really always wear a blindfold? I knew now. It was because the cunning bitch had dollar signs for eyeballs.